What's outside the universe? My friend Melody asked me this question when I was eight years old. I usually had good answers for science questions. I was sort of a library guy, but this time I had no idea what to say. The question was scary. I grew up in southern Utah, in the western part of the United States, and this is the home of red rocks, hot, dry summer nights, and clear skies, and these are perfect conditions for stargazing. And as a kid, Melody and I would bicycle out of town, stare up at the night sky, and ask each other questions about the universe. How big is the Earth? What is the sun made of? Why can't I see a black hole? How far away is that galaxy there? What's at the edge of the universe? When she asked me that one, I stopped and I thought about it. And I finally said, I don't know. And Melody said, my ancestors thought that the Earth was a huge flat rock with a solid dome of sky above it, a few kilometers away, and the stars were painted on the dome, and was all held in the hand of a huge creature that would sometimes shake it. And we stared up at this dome of stars, and finally I said, well, they didn't have telescopes back then, so I think that's a good first guess. But now that we know that the universe is huge, I don't know what's at the edge of the universe. Melody was an indigenous Native American from a local tribe. I don't remember if she was Paiute or Navajo. And the other kids at school would sometimes make fun of Melody, calling her nasty names. She didn't like homework, she didn't like tests, but she ran circles around the other kids in classroom discussions with the teacher. And there was a reason why she and I were friends, because Melody was never afraid to ask the big questions. And when she finally asked me, what's outside the universe? The question caught me off guard. Well, nothing, I said. The universe is everything. And it doesn't make any sense to ask what's outside of everything. Everything is everything. Yeah, but if the universe has an edge, then there must be something beyond the edge, she reasoned. And we stared at the sky for a very long time. And eventually I said, maybe there is no edge and no outside. And Melody said, yeah, maybe the universe just goes on forever and ever, and that's all there is. And after another long pause, finally I said, everything is terrifying. And as you can see, I was a very serious child. <laughs> um, maybe not so completely serious, because to me, terrifying doesn't have to be a bad thing. But before we go too far, we need to answer a very important question. What is the universe? Picture the last time you were out in the wilderness and you stared up at the night sky. Thousands of pinpoints of light, photons, particles of light, traveling from thousands of light, for thousands of light years, a light year being the distance that light travels in one year, to finally reach your eyes and smack into the back of your retinas. When you look up at the night sky, you're looking backward in time. But look closer. In between those points of light, what do you see? It looks like empty space, but it's not. Your eyes are pretty good photon detectors for one particular type of photon, but on cosmic scales, your eyes are terrible experimental apparatuses because they can only see a fairly narrow range of photon wavelengths. And there's so much more hitting the Earth than what we can see with our eyes. If you were to use humanity's best photon detectors, like satellite telescopes, you'd see hidden light 
photons from stars and galaxies millions and billions of light years away, and eventually you'd see something absolutely remarkable, the cosmic microwave background, or CMB, light from when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. This is the closest we can get to a baby picture of our universe. But wait a minute, baby picture, a few hundred thousand years old, that's a pretty old baby. Where's the, where's the light from before that? That light hasn't had time to reach us yet, and most of it never will. All of those stars and the galaxies you see in the sky, they're all moving away from each other in all directions because the universe is expanding. But it's not just the fact of the universe's expansion that makes sense, that, 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 that it's important. Is this still working? Yes. Ah, go back here. But it's, the universe is expanding. But it's not just the fact of the universe's expansion, but the particular way that it did so throughout its history that is important. There's so much that we can't explain if the universe expanded at a constant rate throughout its entire history. Why are there big things in the universe at all, like galaxies or gigantic uh, cosmic structures? Why does the stuff in that part of the sky look more or less like the stuff in that part of the sky? Why does that cosmic microwave background radiation, this baby picture of the universe, why is it essentially uniform in temperature everywhere? Don't let the color coding fool you. My ast astronomer colleagues put that in there to show the tiny gradations, but it's essentially flat in temperature in all directions. None of this stuff makes any sense unless at the very beginning of the universe's expansion 13.8 billion years ago, right at the moment of the Big Bang, the universe didn't just expand at a constant rate, but first insanely inflated before then tapering off to a much more gradual rate. And this absurd inflation of the fabric of space was not just some minor thing. Imagine if we right now took a horse and magically inflated it to the size of the known observable universe in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. That's what inflation was like at the moment of the Big Bang. This inflation and expansion of space happened much faster than the speed of light. And as you know, the speed of light is the highest possible speed that anything can go. Any information, anything meaningful can go. This leads us to a new definition. Our observable universe is a volume of space defined by all of the stuff that could ever possibly send us a light signal that could ever possibly reach us. But this space must be a tiny subset of the entire universe within which there must be a huge number of other observable universes for other observers. And it gets worse. If you look closely at the mathematics behind this absurd inflation of the fabric of space, this inflation should go on forever, infinitely. But in our universe, it didn't. It tapered off and has been going at a much smaller rate for billions of years. This must mean that our universe and the fabric of space upon which it sits can be thought of as two distinct things, because in our universe, inflation stopped. And for the rest of the universe and the mathematics of the, the space-time, it didn't, and tapered off for, uh, and, and, and has been going on infinitely forever. This, in, this, in, uh, this expansion of space we have to then think of in a slightly different perspective, because the universe is expanding, but expanding into what? Nothing. Space itself, the background spatial metric grid upon which everything rests, is being stretched. Two galaxies in our universe are like two pins stuck into a rubber sheet that is being pulled in all directions. From the perspective of an ant on the sheet, 
nothing happened to make the pins move. The fabric of space itself is being stretched, and the distance between the pins is increasing. So if the fabric of space itself is somehow distinct from our universe, and the mathematics of inflation tell us that they should, this inflation should have gone on forever, but in our universe it didn't. Our universe is a tiny pocket that was popped into existence by this insane inflation, infinite inflation of the fabric of space. And as you know, with infinity, if something happens once, <laughs> it happens again and again and again. There must be an almost infinite number of other universes popped into existence by this absurd inflation of the fabric of space. In most of those other universes, inflation probably never stopped, and they're completely empty voids with nothing going on, nothing interesting. But with infinity, there must be other universes like ours. In one of them, one of you wore different shoes here today. In another one, coffee is pink. And in another one, an asteroid obliterated an Earth-like planet just as protozoans were starting to evolve. If our understanding of inflation is correct, then this isn't just some speculative idea, but is required by infinity. But I see the looks on some of your faces, and you're absolutely right to be skeptical. You should be telling me, this is crazy, man. You're a scientist. You need hard evidence. What's the deal with this? This is all circumstantial. And you are absolutely right. But it turns out, this is not the only piece of circumstantial evidence that we have. Our universe seems to be filled with magic numbers, constants of nature that we have no particular, we measure, but we have no particular explanation for why their values are the way they are. And if these values were to be slightly different, our universe would be a completely different place. For example, in 2012, my colleagues and I at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN discovered something called the Higgs boson particle. And the Higgs boson particle is a very weird and important particle. A reminder, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland. And in this tunnel, we use superconducting magnets colder than outer space to accelerate protons, you're made of protons, to almost the speed of light. And then we slam them into each other millions of times per second, briefly recreating the conditions of the universe as they existed just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. And we collect a record of the debris from this collision. And then we sift through this data to look for evidence of new undiscovered particles that would help us answer the biggest open questions of science. And in 2012, when we discovered this Higgs boson particle, there was champagne and celebration, and two white males won a Nobel Prize. What else is new? And then, th but there was actually something really weird about this discovery because we probably shouldn't have found this particle at all. The Largeness of experiments like the Large Hadron Collider is important because larger machines can reach higher collision energies. And the bigger machine, the bigger the, your discovery potential. And this has to do with Einstein. Thanks to Einstein's famous relationship, E equals mc squared, there's an equivalence between collision energy and particle mass. And if nature has a particle with a mass m, it's way up here, and we as a species have only ever designed an experiment with energy that goes up to here, we'll never be able to discover it. So we, we build bigger machines to hopefully expand our uh, ability to discover particles that nature could have just around the corner for us. And the key thing with the Higgs boson is that there's nothing in our theory, our very, 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 very good theory, to prevent the Higgs boson mass from being all the way over here way outside of the range of the Large Hadron Collider, but we found it down here. That's very weird. There's really no way to explain that unless there were some extra particles 
just around the same place as the Higgs boson, maybe just a little bit outside uh, above it. Due to some complicated interactions, they help regulate the Higgs boson mass, and that would be really nice to explain these things. That would be great if we found these particles. We do not see these particles at the Large Hadron Collider. Why is the Higgs boson mass right there? What could be holding it there? Did we just get lucky? And to be clear, it's very good that the Higgs boson exists. The Higgs boson is proof positive that something called the Higgs field exists. And the Higgs field is an invisible jelly that permeates all of space. And it's the thing that allows particles, individual particles, your particles, to have masses at all. If I'm a particle and I'm zipping through the universe, and I'm dragged a little bit by this Higgs jelly, and a little bit of my energy is stuck into a point, which we measure as mass. And that's a really good thing, because without the Higgs field, electrons would have a zero mass. And if electrons had a zero mass, atoms would never have formed in the early universe, and you would never be here right now. So it's good that the Higgs field exists, but what's keeping the Higgs boson mass all the way down here? Maybe it is just luck, but a very special kind of luck. Nature loves statistical distributions. If you hear a nerdier statement here today, let me know and I will fight that person. Nature loves statistical distributions. The average resting heart rate of the people in this room will be distributed as some kind of a Gaussian or normal distribution. If you stand on a street corner, the rate at which cars will pass you will follow some kind of Poisson distribution. In a sense, statistics and math transcend our universe. So what if? Our Higgs boson mass is only one of a possibly infinite number of other Higgs boson masses chosen from a multiverse. In most of those other cases, the Higgs boson mass was something wildly different, and atoms never formed, and those universes are completely dull and empty voids. But at least one time here, the Higgs boson mass was just right. Again, the lack of these particles at the Large Hadron Collider, these extra ones to help regulate the Higgs boson mass, is not proof positive that we live in a multiverse, but it's another piece of overwhelming circumstantial evidence that we should take more seriously this concept. But again, <clears throat> I see the looks on your faces, and you're absolutely right. It's completely valid to be totally skeptical of what I'm saying. This is still just completely circumstantial. I am a scientist. I do demand evidence. How are we going to test this crazy idea? <clears throat> That's a very good question, um, because some of the ways that we have, the ideas that we have, are rather technically difficult to exercise right now. <clears throat> One way is that you can look for a bump on the universe. Remember this insane inflation of the fabric of space that popped into existence an almost infinite number of other universes? What if two of those universes happened to expand right next to each other and bumped into each other? Could that be what this small blue dot, this cold spot, on our cosmic microwave background radiation picture, the baby picture of the universe, could that be evidence of a collision of universes? The jury is still out as to whether this hypothesis fits the data better than some other, but we're still looking into this. Another way, we can look for new high energy, high mass particles at bigger machines, collider experiments, AKA my day job. So the, just a few months ago here at CERN, or at CERN, we announced our plans for something called the Future Circular Collider, the next generation that would be 100 kilometers around and be able to reach energies about seven times what we can do now. This is an amazing, amazing project, and if it goes through, it will allow us to have completely uncharted territory with discovery potential to help us understand whether, for example, we live in a multiverse. But even if we were to find, or if we're not find something at the FCC, would that really convince me that we live in a multiverse? No. 
It turns out that it's still okay if these particles to help regulate the Higgs mass are just outside of the range of both the LHC and this next generation of collider. So if we don't find them there, we go bigger. What about a particle collider around the circumference of the moon? This sounds crazy, but if you think about it, there are lots and lots of pieces of, there's lots of threads of people that are interested in going back to the moon to set up a base. And what are you going to do with a base on the moon? Why not build a gigantic particle of physics experiment? And I don't have time to go into it right now, but here's, for example, something that someone in this room would need to innovate for us to actually make this happen. This thing, and this thing, and this thing. I don't have, I'm totally out of time here, but basically there's so many things here that somebody in this room would need to help us innovate so we could make such a thing happen. But what would this do? Would this really be enough for me? If we don't find particles at my particle collider around the circumference of the moon, would that satisfy me? Would I then say, yes, I know we live in a multiverse? No. To really answer the question definitively, we would need to go big we would need to go very big. We'd need to reach something called the Planck scale. And this is such a gigantically high energy scale that it's almost unfathomable for us. To reach the Planck scale by some estimates, we would need to build a particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system. Clearly, we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen, but you know, luckily we're at 15 seconds fest, which is like Woodstock for innovators. So you know, join me afterwards and we'll brainstorm ways to make this happen. But when we build the ultimate Hadron Collider, and we will, when we build this, what will we do with the answers that we get from it? Even if we were to find overwhelming circumstantial evidence that you and I live in a multiverse, there's still probably no way for us to ever contact or interact with or exchange information with another universe. Such a concept currently makes no sense. So are such questions meaningless? You may think so. And in fact, some scientists would agree with you. And in fact, some scientists attack our attempts to learn more about the universe with bigger high energy machines like the FCC, calling such questions unscientific. But is that true? We started from known science, observations of the world around us, and we followed the chain of logic to arrive at the conclusion that we may live in a multiverse. It's a startling, scary conclusion, but it's clearly scientific. Just because we can't answer the question now doesn't mean we never will. Why do some people object to such questions? Could it be that they're afraid of the answer? Could it be that, is it possible to turn that down for a bit? Is, can, we, can we cut the music? Ah, yes. Just give, just give me three minutes, I promise. Th totally th cool. You've got three minutes. Three minutes, thanks. Yeah. Could it be that people are afraid of the answer? And is this the same fear that caused people in the past to object to similar questions, such as, is the Earth really at the center of the universe or the solar system? Or are the stars painted on a round dome a few kilometers above our heads, the fear that you and I are not as special as we think we are. Perhaps more accurately, the fear that what you know now is not all there is to know. Does this same fear affect you? What might happen if you quit your day job and worked on that huge thing that you've been thinking about for years, like starting a humanitarian organization? What might happen if you stopped working on what you're working on now and instead helped some particle physicists work on next generation collider experiments that would help us discover things in a much more efficient manner? All of the crazy stuff I was talking about, a moon collider, a collider around the circumference of the solar system, all of that is based upon extrapolations of current technology. Right now, lots and lots of research is going on with something called plasma wakefield technology, that if it works, it'll allow us to accelerate particles 
to much higher speeds in a much smaller range? What if you join this effort to help some of the most brilliant minds in the, in the world understand the basic underpinnings of nature even better to help us push into the unknown, to understand things about dark matter, time travel, the, the uh, dark energy, the, the moment of the Big Bang, the, how gravity and quantum mechanics work together? What if you join this instead? What if you stopped working on a long string of smartphone apps and instead worked on that big thing that you've been thinking about for a long time instead, such as how do we solve poverty? How do we get governments to stop illegally surveilling their citizens? The answer to all of these questions is quite possibly nothing. But you don't currently know that, and you never will unless you take the leap and find out. And to me, the safety of ignorance will never compete with the scary beauty and terrifying joy of knowledge. Always ask the big question. Always allow yourself the bravery of stepping into the unknown and always seek out new knowledge to vanquish the fear because you know what? This fear distracts us from some of the basic physical objective truths of reality. At the end of the day, we don't need to be afraid of multiple universes because we know at least one thing for sure. There is at least one universe And there's at least one you, and there's at least one me. And you and all of us are all in the same universe together. And when I see the government of the United States putting children into cages on the Mexico-US border, and when I see how millions of otherwise smart people are being tricked by racists and white nationalists into voting for far-right parties all over the world, all over Europe, and when I see that we've allowed decades of unfettered global capitalism to basically destroy the earth, and we're not doing anything about it. And when I think about my friend Melody, and how the other kids would mock and bully her, and how this made it difficult for her to go to class, and how she never went to high school, I feel anger. But it's not just regular anger, I feel regular anger too, but as a physicist, I feel an extra layer of anger because when we allow such things to happen, we're betraying this cosmic truth that you and me are parts of the same universe and we're all in this universe together. And when you and I, as curious human beings, ask questions about the universe, you and I, humans, are the method by which the universe asks questions about itself. And so back on that rock, the red rock in Utah, I said to Melody, everything is terrifying. And she thought about it for a while, and finally she said, yeah, but it would be scarier if I was out here by myself. And I looked at her and I said, yeah. And we stared up at the dome of stars, the stars and galaxies watching us from very far away. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible. No, you guys are great. Thank you. You yeah, guys are great. You guys. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you for coming. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. So. Thanks. I don't know if anybody else was thinking. I'm like, this is the stuff that science fiction is made of. Or it's like definitely, you can I, start I, to dream about possibilities. I agree with the first word, but not the second word. Science, but not fiction. I love yes. that. But if you think about creating a story and what the possibilities are, it's absolutely incredible. 
Um, now, I did want to say, I didn't stop you because your talk was, you could tell everybody was just absolutely mesmerized by you. And during your talk, you mentioned Woodstock. And I have to say, you're a bit of, I'm going to say, a rock star slash celebrity <laughs> right now. Because the amount of questions that I know that we're getting from the audience are huge. Um, so what I wanted to offer is, even though the day is done, I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to ask James questions. So are you cool if we go a little bit longer? <laughs> Woo! Okay. That's, that's dangerous because I can talk for a very long time, so. <laughs> Don't worry. I might call you up at some point. Okay, we do have some mics in the audience, and so we've got some people here walking around with them. Um, <laughs> so I love the first question. That's a good one, yeah. Which is a good one. Do yeah. we really exist? Because after two beers, I'm not sure. It usually takes so, me about. What do you think? It usually takes me about four beers, and then I start to wonder <laughs> if we. But you know, each person to their own. Um, this notion of existence, you know, as you can tell, the questions that we're addressing at CERN and particle physics and astrophysics, they behind the scenes they're very existential. They're almost like ontological and epistemological yeah. questions. And so the notion of whether we exist, I mean. From some perspectives, yes, you can conclude that we definitely do exist, but the notion of does the universe exist uh, only because we allow it to, because we allow it into our consciousness, or does it somehow ob exist outside of our consciousness? That's something that I currently can't really conclude. Um, so on that, while you were talking, one of the thoughts that kept popping into my head was, well, then what about the nature of time? What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, so as you know from Einstein, you know, Einstein pointed out that back in the you know, for many millennia, we thought that space and time were kind of two separate things, right? Yeah. Because space, I can move forwards, I can move backwards, I can go back and forth, I can go up and down, but time seems to only go in one direction. And it didn't, for a long time, it didn't make sense to think of these as kind of connected, but Einstein pointed out that they're very, very connected. You can't really think separately of space and time. You have to think of space-time as one continuum. And so what we are learning, what we have learned, is that Space, we know, can be bent. Space is actually malleable. It has, you know, it, it can, it's stuff that can be moved in a sense. And it's related to, you know, this absurd inflation of the fabric of space that happened right at the moment of the Big Bang. Um, and in, even in our universe, we know that with a large enough gravitational field, you can bend space. You can very much bend space, like a black hole. We know that a black hole is basically a puncture in the fabric of space. If you have a big rubber sheet, it's like a, a spear going down so that it, you can't get outside of this thing. But because of Einstein, you know that if space can be bent, time can be bent too. And we know this is the case. And in fact, every single one of you has evidence of the fact that time is bent by the presence of stuff because the GPS system in your phone has to be corrected for a redshift mm -hmm. due to the amount of time that it takes the signal to come from the Earth, from the satellites, and back. Otherwise, if it was not corrected by, for this, it would, uh, it, and this, this redshift is due to the, the, the gravitational pull of the well of the Earth, if it was not corrected by that, GPS would be off by a lot. So we know that these things exist. The nature of time is still a little bit uh, mysterious. So it's a kind of a long way to answer your question, but the real answer is that time we kind of understand, but kind of its basic nature is still a little bit mysterious to us. But I love how you describe it and you can make it so relatable. And I think if you've been talking, it sparked some questions in the audience. Um, yes, I have actually two questions. So the first one is, why should the Planck scale reveal any, uh, like everything? I, I don't really understand it. And the second thing is, does Einstein's equation not also um, implicate something with the momentum about stuff and not, also the, not only the mass? Uh, yes, so the E equals MC squared, yes, we have a, secretly a physicist here in the audience because <laughs> she pointed out there's a part of the equation that I left off. And in fact, it's still okay to leave it off there if that extra part is zero, but there is another part which has momentum in it too. For the purpose of this, this discussion, it's not so important because we're talking about things at rest. So this notion is the rest mass. So an electron by itself, just sitting around, it has a mass just intrinsic to itself. If it then starts moving, things get a little bit weird. And so the notion of the mass and the momentum have to, be, have to go together into a, a single object. But for our purposes, the momentum you can kind of ignore uh, for this argument. But you're right, there's an extra part there. Um, the other part is, what was the other part of the question, the first part? Sorry, say again. Why should the Planck scale, or uh, why can the Planck scale yeah, so, everything? So the Planck scale is something that a very famous physicist back in the 30s came up with, Max Planck. And so Planck is the responsible for this thing called Planck's constant, and he was one of the, the, the architects of quantum mechanics. He was one of the guys that discovered all of these amazing things about quantum mechanics itself. And quantum mechanics is 
often gets this reputation as weird. It's like, ooh, there's spookiness and it's like bizarre and like, the nature of world, you know, reality is probabilistic. It's like, oh, okay, once you, you know, get used to it, it's not so weird anymore. You know, and just, just because you and I didn't evolve in a quantum mechanical like, you know, range of the Earth, that doesn't mean the quantum mechanics is weird. It's just kind of counterintuitive for us. But if you then get into, this, uh, uh, into the details of quantum mechanics, Max Planck came up with this thing called H-bar, which is this constant of nature, Planck's constant, which is the, the scale at which we sort of have the transition from the macroscopic world, the world that you and I evolved in, which is not quantum, and then the, the transition into the small, which is the quantum world, the tiny particles and the way that they behave, and the place where reality starts to get counterintuitive for us. So if you take Planck's constant, which again is just something that pops out of the equations and is right there, and you take some of these other constants of nature, things like uh, C, the speed of light. Again, these are kind of, these are sort of uh, magic numbers. We don't really have like explanations for why these numbers are the way they are. And, you know, to be clear, anytime you, a physicist sees a number without, uh, sees a thing without an explanation, we hate that. It's like we really, really want to know what caused everything, what the basic cause for things are. So if you see h-bar and you see C and you see the gravitational constant, you see some of these other ones, Planck just kind of put these all together and he had arranged them in certain ways so that so-called dimensions worked out, he ended up with kind of the, the edge of physics reality, the edge of, that basically you can use these constants to define the very possible extremes beyond which our understanding of physics starts to break down. And so the Planck scale, the Planck scale would be the place where naturally because of the way that you've just put these constants together, and again, they're constants of nature, we can't change them, we can't do it, they're real, they, they're measurable. You put them together and immediately it pops out this length scale, time scale, energy scale, where quantum mechanics, h-bar, and gravity, g, this thing, they have to have something to do with each other. They have to start to talk to each other. Otherwise, our understanding of uh, uh, physics as currently constituted makes no sense. The problem with that, of course, is that it's such a, such a huge energy range that it's totally outside of our civilization's capacity to probe. And if you want to think of it from a slightly different perspective, <laughs> it's a bit weird in a way that we have to build such huge machines to probe the smallest possible yeah. things. You know, the, the Large Hadron Collider is not a microscope, it's like a femtoscope. It allows us to see things that are about, I guess, 10 to the minus 15 meters. But beyond that, it's totally possible there's structure down below that. If I were to take you and to zoom in on your body and I go past the nucleus and get to an individual electron, as it stands now, I can look at the electron about 10 to the minus, I, yeah, I guess 10, 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 17 meters. But our theory says that the electron should in fact be zero volume. It's z no spatial extent. An electron should be nothing. But I can't verify that right now. That's just part of our equation. That's part of our math. It tells us that that's probably the way it is. All I can currently empirically see is about 10 to the minus 17 meters. In principle, if I were to build a bigger machine, I could see smaller than that. And that's the place where this new stuff should, might, might be able to show up. Maybe an electron is not actually an individual chunk of stuff, but instead maybe has some, some structure inside there. If you've heard of something called string theory, string theory postulates that maybe there's one other level of structure down below, which is kind of like a little cur curled up piece of string that wobbles and vibrates in a certain way. The problem with that is that even with a, a FCC or a moon collider, there's still no way for us to get from 10 to the minus 18 to where that happens, because it's probably 10 to the minus 18 meters down to about 10 to the minus 40 meters. And still, that's not zero, but that's the place where this postulate that there's more stuff going on, that either string theory or, you know, the, or, or we get to where Planck's constant take, comes, uh, comes into play, that's going to be the range at which we'll have to go. So again, unfortunately, that seems probably out of the range of our civilization for probably millennia, unless someone in this room innovates some way for us to, to do this. So that's a homework for the weekend. So you've heard the challenge. Somebody needs to innovate. <laughs> um, we've got time for one more question. So I thought it'd be really interesting if we could explore what would change if we find out that there is a multiverse? And how will it have an impact on humanity? And why does it matter? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a very valid question. I mean, to my mind, it's weird when I hear the, the last question because it's like, these, these are such intrinsically fascinating things for me. I sort of go, how could it not matter? Ah, you know, somebody, I could, if I meet someone, it's like, no, nah, I don't care about that. It's like, it's like does not compute. No, but I, it makes sense that we, you know, day-to-day -day life, we don't, you know, a lot of people don't have the same kind of, uh, they don't have the same job that I do. I'm very privileged to be able to do what I do. Um, and, you know, the reason that it should matter is because, again, 
it speaks to this type of research speaks to the kind of basic questions that you ask yourself when you're sort of sitting alone, sitting out, staring up at the stars, sitting maybe on the on the toilet or something. And you're like, why does anything mean anything? You know, these are the types of questions we're trying to answer, um, but in a more okay. controlled way. Uh, so, what was the first part of your question? I'm sorry. The um, and it was also so. What will happen ah, if, we will change. Change yeah. if we find out or change if we find out we live in a multiverse? So that's the part that, like I was saying in the talk, it starts to get at the edge of where we start to define these questions as scientific at all. You know, the, a lot of people like to draw a line between you know a scientific question and sort of just a philosophical mm -hmm. question or something like that. Yeah. Um, and that's the part where we currently don't have an answer to it. Yeah. To my mind, the question itself is, do we live in a multiverse? Are there other universes? Yeah. The question is still scientific, because like I said, we followed this chain of logic to arrive at this conclusion. It's not, it's not a wild speculation. It's just the requirement. However, we currently have no friggin' clue as to how to test this. There's no possible you know, method someone can come up with right now that says, I have, an, I have a way to talk to another universe. Again, it's a totally ill-defined question right now. Until, in the future, somebody is able to innovate some way to discover some new thing that allows us to talk to other universes. For example, here's something that is, a, is not just, spe it is speculation, but it's not just wild science fiction idea. Some ideas about what black holes actually are. Some people think the black holes are, of course, you've heard things of wormholes. You've heard the idea of, you know, uh, uh, a black hole could be a portal to another part of the universe. Some people think that black holes themselves are evidence of the so-called nucleation or creation of other universes throughout our universe. So in principle, those could be portals to other universes. I, you know, I, I currently have no way to verify that because I, I don't know about you, but I can't travel to a black hole today and go into it and then give you the answer out, you know, to, to send you an answer outside of the black hole. If you could do that, let me know, because we really should collaborate. But currently, I have no idea how to do this. So the, the way that it would change if we were to discover, if we were to definitively discover that we, that we lived in a multiverse, definitively, then that would also, ex probably at the same time, uh, give you the technology to be able to exchange information with another you know, universe. One day, who knows?